Alright, so welcome to another episode of Weird Shit, and this time, uh, this one has been some time coming, we're going to talk a little bit about loops, and uh, all the different ways that I've found to loop stuff in Blender. So, first couple of things I'm going to show you is just sort of introductory, and are things that you need to think of when you're looping, and um, we'll just jump right in. So the very first thing that I do, or maybe control U, sorry, is in the interface, and the editing menu, set your keyframe interpolation to linear by default. That way when you create keyframes, so let's quickly create a keyframe. Let's grab a cube and just hit the location keyframe and actually move it over to the end. Hit the location keyframe again. And just bring this up and switch this to the graph editor. So this is really cool when you're looping stuff. Um, Generally what will happen, if you haven't set this to linear, you get these Bezier frames and then you have to go in and change them to linear each time, um, depending on how you want your animation. But most of the time, if you want things moving fluently and sort of looping together, um, you're going to use linear interpolation keyframes. So I set that up to start with because uh, it's a lot easier to work with. So we're just going to delete that and go back to our timeline here and just reset a little bit. Um, and then the second thing that I want to talk about is just something very simple. Um, when you're looping things, so let's say I'm just going to loop um, our monkey turning around. So I'm just going to scale that up for a sec. And I want this to turn 360 degrees. Now I'm going to change my end frame here to something like 120 frames, so it's only five seconds. Um, a very common mistake that I see people make is when you go to the beginning, it will just set a rotation frame. Or actually, what I prefer doing is right clicking on the Y here and inserting a single keyframe. So, or not the Y actually, we're going to delete or clear those keyframes. We need to uh, insert a single keyframe on the Z axis. So, I'm going to go to the end now and say 360 degrees and hit I again. It's just going to keyframe that. So, this can actually turn around and we can still move it. In, uh, move it around or if we wanted to still rotate it on the x-axis and it would uh, keep those other two axes which I really like because it gives you more flexibility and um, you want to keep the keyframes as clean as possible when you're looping things because once you start getting into um, sort of more uh, advanced things and you're, you're using them together and um, it gets a bit cluttered if you you have a bunch of keyframes in there that are basically keyframing something that you're not using. So what I wanted to get out with this very quickly is you can see at the very end, if we just look here, how it just sort of ticks, it hangs very slightly. And the reason for that is very simple. Because we set it to our last and our first keyframe, there's two keyframes in our sequence that are actually the same. So I'm holding down shift and going, uh, hitting left and right to go from to the beginning and the end of my timeline. You see they're the same, and they shouldn't be, because if you want it to loop perfectly, then this last keyframe should actually be the anticipatory uh, frame for the frame that comes after it. So a very easy fix to do that is just delete the very last keyframe. So deleting single keyframes will just delete the keyframe, replacing them, uh, will replace the keyframe, and clearing keyframes uh, will clear all the keyframes that you've made before. So it's really handy to be able to use those. So I'm just gonna delete this last one. What I'm gonna do now is hit right to go one frame past the end of my frame sequence, then put on the 360 degrees. And now if you look, they'll actually be close, but they won't be the same. So now if we turn them again, you'll see the loop just became perfect. So very simple, very basic, but uh, it's definitely something to keep in mind as we move on. So this is just a few things that I've been, been doing as well. Then another really cool thing that you can do is let's say you've animated this and you actually want to make it 240 frames rather than um, rather than 120. You can either go in and redo your keyframes or if you really wanted to, let's just sit home here to show it, um, you can use keyframe modifiers to extend that. So for example, I'm going to add in the cycles modifier. And if you look into the modifier here, I'm just going to make that a little bit bigger. You can repeat with offset, for example. And now um, those keyframes are going to go ad infinitum, which is really nice because, for example, if you're rendering something like motion blur, you want your motion blur on the first frame to already be um, being influenced by the frame before that. 
So that way uh, you, you can be sure that your motion blur looks good from the beginning to the end of your video as well, which is very important. So if we now look at it, we can see we can go back to our timeline if we want to. It'll actually go past those 360 degrees and you'll see it count up. And because we set it up perfectly for 120 frames, it will work perfectly for 240 frames as well, which is really cool. Because that's a really easy way of extending um, your project or your loop if you really need to, if you want to do other stuff to change. So that brings me on to the first set of actual sort of techniques for looping things. Um, this is just all things you need to be aware of. So I'm going to set this back to 120. And uh, I want to keep these loops fairly, fairly simple and fairly quick so we don't have to look at 20 seconds each time. So the next thing I want to have a look at is all right, let's say you have this mesh. I'm going to be creating stuff as I go along here just to give you an idea, but I'll save it all out um, so you can uh, you can look at the sort of the technical examples and you can download them from the um, from the description. So I'm just going to subdivide this actually subdivide it maybe 49 times. So I always subdivide on like 49 or 24 or whatever. So that way you get 50 actual um, polygons, just little things. But when you're looping things, it's really good to work with even numbers and things you can remember very easily and distances like 100 or 200 or whatever. Because um, if you're going to be moving your camera, you really want to make sure that all your math is sort of correct. And then you could still scale stuff and move it around afterwards if you want to. But I like starting from a point where I know all the math is sort of the same and it's correct. So. Let's just get into a very basic one. Um, I'm going to displace this. And let's say we want this to be something like a fake landscape or whatever. I'm just going to keep it very simple though. It's not uh, going to be beautiful, but it's just functional. So there we go. Maybe just even a little bit bigger, something like that. And you could decrease the contrast. There we go. And now we just have a very simple mesh. But let's say we want a camera to move sort of um, above it, but we want it to look correct. So I'm just going to create a new camera really quickly. Shift it on the Y axis, reset the rotation. Let's have a look. So let's go from minus 15 and rotate it 90 degrees on the X axis. Move it up. And let's say this is our camera. And obviously, you can make these a lot longer if you want your horizon to be a lot further away. But I'm going to move my camera and I'm going to move it at the beginning. It's going to be at minus 15. And again, I'm going to just going to insert the single keyframe. And at the end, I'm going to move it to, let's say this one is 20. So I'm going to move it to five because the size, oh, sorry, the radius of my plane there, um, or the size is about 20 units. So now you'll move above it. Now, something that can be quite annoying is if you want to loop this, First thing you could do is just add an array and maybe offset it 20 in the Y. But the problem is you're going to have this, um, this seam, which doesn't look good. Now, usually what I'll do is before I actually use the array, I'll throw in a mirror modifier first. And then uh, you'll have to create a we, an empty to define where that mirror is coming from. So we move the empty 10 units over because we know, again, this one is 20 units in length. And this is what I talked about with all the even numbers is it keeps your workflow a lot quicker if you remember how big all this stuff is. So if it's like 75.39 units, then it's going to be a real pain in the butt to keep uh, to keep an overview. So what I just I just created an extra empty here. And then in the mirror, I can define the not in the array, but in the mirror, I can find the empty and make sure it's mirroring in the Y axis. And now all of a sudden we've gotten rid, rid of our seam. And then because this side is the same as this side now, we can even array it and make sure our offset is 40 because we just doubled the length. And now we get almost, you know, almost perfect seams. Um, if we merge these here, just turn on the merge. Now you get these perfect seams and you can loop it as many times as you want. And that way our camera, as you'll see, should look the same. Oh no, of course it's not going to look the same because one thing to remember is uh, our object, because we mirrored it, became twice the size. So in our frame after our last frame, we're going to have to add another 20. So um, even if you don't want to do it out of your head, you can just hit plus 20, hit the I key, 
and now you'll see we'll have a perfect loop. And of course you can increase the size of this as you need it and you can see it loops just fine. So that's one way of doing things. And um, another really cheeky way of doing things is to use things like doors and tunnels. So let's say um, we have just a cube here and then I'm going to move it over. I'm going to hold control to move it uh, in increments. So now I know it's at minus 10. As you can see, I've done this quite a bit now. So you, I've got sort of a very uh, basic workflow to make all this stuff work properly. And I'm just going to move it over. So my, um, so my origin point is at the corner of this thing. And it's like I said, it's going to be very, very simple. Duplicate this over and what I'll, what I'm doing will become clear in just a second. So now I've got these two cubes that basically have their origin points at, um, at the corner. So that means if we rotate them on the z-axis, they'll open up. So what you can do, for example, is um, if you'd want to hide, and I'm going to make these just a little bit bigger. If you still have a seam that you really can't rid of, uh, can't get rid of, and you want to hide it, there we go, something like that. And these aren't perfect, but that's okay. Let's see what are the dimensions here. Three and three, that's fine. There we go, and I'm just going to move it down. A lot of this you can just place by hand and not have to worry about. So let's say you want your camera to move, uh, but you have a seam that you want to get rid of. What you can do is use these as doors. So I'm just going to animate them. Uh, where's my Z? So insert a single keyframe here, and then insert a single keyframe here. And you see this in a lot of different things. Um, where are we? And I'm gonna insert a single keyframe here and on this one, the same thing as well. There we go, and make sure to insert that. And hopefully it won't go haywire. No, nope, there we go. So now we're just opening doors and let me just have a look at the dope sheet and move those over a little bit. maybe something like 12 frames. There we go. And then you could just duplicate those. So um, I generally duplicate stuff by using Alt-D because they become instances and then they're less of a load on the GPU. So Alt-D, Y 40? Because we know it's 40 frames in. But the cool thing is, and I probably did something really dumb by instancing them like that. Let's see if I can get rid of these keyframes. I'm going to use clear keyframes. Yeah, they're still stuck together, aren't they? Or not? Yeah. So in this case, I shouldn't have used Alt-D to duplicate them as instances, but just Shift-D and then 40. And I'm just going to clear keyframes. This is a very simple proof of concept, but you'll see that um, if your door was like the size of your view, you could get rid of these very quickly and very easily. So this is just one way of doing things. Um, so this is the first example, and let's get into some more interesting things because these are just very basic, and I wanted to get into some more um, cool stuff in just a sec. So our second example, I'm just going to close all this back up uh, and leave this the dope sheet is fine. Okay, so the second example um, is going to involve displacement again and some dynamic paint and how you can actually get those to loop. So I do very simple things when it comes to, to displacement. Um, it's not, yeah, like I said, they're simple tricks, but they work really well. So I'm going to do this one, um, maybe, sorry. 99 cuts, so I know there are 100 polygons on each side. 
Um, I'm not doing super complicated stuff. I'm just showing you all the different building blocks that I use. So um, you can tweak this to your own, uh, your own liking as you would need it. Let's use the marble one. I haven't used that one all that much. Um, bring up the size. Uh, maybe not that one. I'll just stick with the one I use a lot. I tend to use the um, distorted noise here quite a lot because it gives some really interesting results depending on, on what you do with it. So I'm just going to leave it set to something like this. And let's just exaggerate the displacement a little bit so you get a good idea of what it looks like. We go and let's say we want to animate this but we want to animate it so it's um, it's the same the entire time so what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna switch this over and I'm just gonna put in another camera so each time you can have a camera view to look at to see how it loops and how it actually pertains so whatever every time I'm hitting alt R I'm just resetting the um, the rotation of the camera so X90 there we go and why aren't we seeing anything? Oh, because we have to change the camera in the scene view here. So let's change it to camera one. Now that's our active camera. So now we just have that sort of in the image. Um, again, I'm going to keep it fairly simple. But let's say we want this all moving around and we want it to loop perfectly. Well, you could start by <clears throat> trying to manipulate a bunch of parameters in here, but I don't really like that. So the easiest way I found to do it is to create a new curve and create an empty. So now we just have this plane axis empty, and then we're going to use constraints to basically have that um, empty move around our curve. So I'm going to put in the follow path constraint on the empty, set it to Bezier circle, and then you can see we can have this offset. Now, this doesn't seem to make a lot of sense yet, but once you know that um, you can actually use this empty, if we set this to object, we can use this empty for the texture coordinates. So that's empty one, and I'll be sure to name these and clean the file up a little bit so you can have a look at it yourself. And now what it's doing, now it's actually grabbing the um, texture coordinates based on this this empty over here. So what we want uh, is we want to make sure that it always ends up sort of in the same spot and the same rotation. And because we're constraining it to this curve, that'll actually work just fine. So on my first frame, I'm going to hit I, and then go to last frame and hit right once more to go to the frame after that. And I know uh, already that one, uh, 0 to 100 is a perfect loop. So now if we play that, you'll actually see it moving around. And you can see stuff happening, and um, this is fairly quick, obviously. So then you can tweak it a little bit. Like I like to turn on follow curve as well because it gives you a slightly different animation. And then you can just move that curve around and twist it around to get sort of a different looking animation depending on where it is. And you can see it sort of follows the, the origin point, and you can mess with that and put it in different places just to see what happens. And now it goes completely crazy because it's not on the same axes and it's sort of completely offset. Generally, what I'll do in then uh, do then is go in and maybe tweak the size to have it slow down a little bit, or um, you know, bring the distortion maybe down a little bit. Just anything you can do to to make it look different. And I'm doing this over five seconds, so you can uh, change the size of this uh, of this loop and change the length rather time wise and you'll have the same effect it'll slow down look a, a bit more interesting so um, you can mess with the size of this as well as you can see the effect sort of changes slightly as you change uh, the size and again moving it has different effects on it and putting in different uh, different rotation values and then if you look at it from here it just loops perfectly the whole time and nobody's the wiser. So that's one of my, my favorite ones um, to loop stuff with. And I want to take this concept a little bit further and actually use it for um, dynamic paint, for example. So let's say I'm going to set up uh, something very quickly. And subdivide it 99 times again. And then I'm going to duplicate this plane. So 
one of these is going to be the driver for the dynamic paint and one of these uh, or the brush and the other is going to be the um, canvas so I'm gonna bring the brush down a little bit I'm gonna put in the displace over here where are we displace new texture and bring this up just a touch let's try something else this might look a little weird but um, you'll see in a second that it gives really interesting results when combined with uh, the dynamic paint add-on or dynamic paint modifier rather. So again, set up a circle and I just make this 20, a radius of 20. Um, you can change it anyway, anytime you want. Um, I just kind of know from experience that all this fits together quite nicely. And these are the default values I use, but it doesn't mean they're necessarily the best or anything. It's a good point to get you started. So again, we've got empty number three, um, constraint to path, Bezier circle number one. I'm gonna hit follow curve, do the same, hit I to keyframe zero, and then go to the frame after that and hit 100, and hit I to keyframe it as well. And now we're gonna do the same thing here and grab empty number three, I believe it is, or number two, yeah, there we go. So now you see it actually turning around and moving. Um, again, if I manage to select that empty real quick. What the other thing you can do as well, if you want to make this more interesting, because the empty is basically still in zero, zero, zero space, you can also animate this. So what I like to do sometimes to add in some complexity, as you saw, it was sort of turning around, but it doesn't look super interesting. We just have the texture turning around and I want something that looks a little bit cooler than that. Um, what you can do as well is animate the empty itself and animate the rotation, for example. So I'm going to insert a single keyframe on the X here. 360 degrees on the 121st frame, so the frame after the last. Now you'll see the texture actually shifts and changes and um, some really interesting things. So now we're going to add in the dynamic paint. So uh, on the first one, this is gonna be our brush. And I'm gonna do proximity because we don't actually have a volume because it's a plane. And I'm gonna add in dynamic paint here as well. And no, not the brush, but the canvas. And then I'm gonna set this to vertex weight and then you'll see it go all blue. So now we're gonna have to define our proximity and um, I'm just gonna move this mesh up a little bit. There we go. Now you can see it's actually painting this mesh, which is pretty cool, but I wanna use this fade parameter, for example, and now we get uh, something even more interesting. So let's have a look at the, um, again, I'm gonna add in a displace modifier, but we're gonna use the vertex group that we have to define. So if you look at the dynamic paint down here, there's a DP weight um, vertex group we're gonna have to make. So I'm gonna create that. And then um, if you just select that vertex group, you'll actually see it displacing it, which is really cool. Um, you could even add in a, an extra texture, but what it does is it gives you sort of this fade out effect. Now, as you might see, um, we're having issues because it's not exactly looping properly. And now the reason for that is very simple. In our um, dynamic paint, we have this fade parameter. I'm gonna turn off the slow and I'll set it to maybe 72. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save this very quickly and save this file. I think it's episode eight, I might change it anyway. It doesn't really matter. And now what I can do is I can bake this cache out. So if you're opening this file at home, if you're trying to follow along, um, you might have to uh, bake this yourself. But the issue is, if we play it here, well, it doesn't really have any previous information because it starts the dynamic paint at frame one. So to actually make this work, you're gonna have to add the amount of uh, fade frames that you put in here. So I'm gonna put plus 72. So that brings up to 192. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna add, so I'm just gonna show you very quickly. If I add 72 to here and 72 to here, we're gonna actually render from frame 73 to 192, but it will it will have that um, that bit of dynamic paint, 
dynamic paint built in. We're not there yet, so I just wanna show you very quickly what we have right now, and then show you um, how we're gonna make this work. So I'm gonna bake this, and it should bake past the keyframes, there we go. And now we have something that's already looking a little bit better, but it's not quite right just yet. And the reason for that is the thing that I explained in the beginning is we wanna do something with these keyframes. We wanna make sure that they still turn past our uh, original setting. So if you go into the graph editor and add in the cycles and repeat with offset. So I use control and um, one tick on my mouse wheel up to set it to repeat with offset. And then you can copy that, click the other ones, paste them. And now what's gonna happen is it stopped originally at 120 and it's just gonna keep going. But because it's a perfect loop, if we free the bake and rebake it now, um, because we're playing from 73 to 192, we should get a perfect loop in our dynamic paint. And there you go. So now you can start doing really interesting things with this. Like generally I'll throw in something like a smooth modifier, for example, uh, if I can find it, smooth. Just use smooth at high values, and now you get these really, really interesting things um, that move in sort of a very organic way, and yet um, they're not exactly like displacement. They have that little bit extra. So, for example, what you could do is if you created just a very simple cube mesh here. Let's have a look at the. And um, yeah, sorry, I was kind of mumbling to myself there. So. I'm just gonna parent this to the um, plane here. So selecting the cube first and the plane second, parent it, and now I'm gonna turn on dynamic paint, or sorry, dupliverts rather, set it to the verts, and now you get these really interesting looking things, um, or even you could set it to faces, and then they move with the face, and you could have, actually have them scale, maybe scale them up a little bit. And now you get all this really interesting uh, intricate looking movement that actually loops perfectly, which is a lot of fun to use. And um, I would definitely recommend playing around with these and adding extra modifiers on top to see what you can get. But this is how I've done a lot of, lot of loops, um, just by figuring out a way to loop certain modifiers that create interesting animation, and then um, sort of adding on top from there. I'm just gonna bring the scale down a little bit so you can see the original uh, thing a little bit better. There we go. Now you can still see the uh, the dupliverts under it. So um, if you're opening this file, you'll probably have to reset the uh, start and end frames. I'm gonna set them back to one and 120. So the next one is really fun as well, actually. Um, and this one's really cool. So I'm gonna create another plane. And as you've seen, I've done this quite a, quite a few times at this point. Bring up, there we go. So there's another really cool modifier uh, that I like to loop that you can use for that same dupliverts trick as well, and that's the ocean modifier. Now, initially you might think, well, the ocean modifier doesn't quite loop, um, and I'm just gonna set this up to displace, set the resolution a little bit higher so we get some more interesting waves. And you have to sort of hand animate this, and it doesn't really loop perfectly, or at least I haven't found um, a, perfect, a perfect loop uh, to that to begin with. So. What I do is I actually go in and I'll, uh, I'll throw in a subdivision surface here and see if it still runs real time. And what I'll do is, let's say, if I wanna animate this from one or from zero, and I'm not in the right place, so I'm just gonna delete that keyframe. It's gonna go back to the beginning. Hit I, go to the end, and uh, set this to maybe something like five and then hit I again. Now I'm not doing any perfect loop stuff just yet. I can still change that keyframe afterwards. Um, but this just gives you an idea and I'm gonna turn off the subsurf because it's not working real time, unfortunately. Um, but just looking at this, I'm just gonna pull it up a little bit. Uh, we can change the choppiness, for example. We can change the scale a little bit. And now we get this really cool, um, looking ocean surface. But what if we wanna loop this perfectly? Cause you can see it's very far from being able to loop. Now I found a really cool uh, trick on the Blender Stack Exchange. So I'm not gonna actually take credit for that. Uh, I believe if you type in ocean looping, um, it's actually on there. So I can't remember who the original post was from, but 
Anyway, all it really is is, um, as you can see, if I change the scale, it actually changes the scale of the waves. But what we can do is actually animate that scale and um, have two ocean modifiers sort of beginning and ending at the same time, or sort of one begins at one at the same point as the other one ending. So I'm going to clear the keyframes here and just start from the beginning. So let's say that speed was okay for me. So I know that over my 120 frames, I want to go from zero to five in time. So I know that when my um, first one sort of ends, it's going to be at five. So I'm going to start this one from five. Hit I, go to the end and start at this one. And I make this one to 10. Now um, I can just copy this ocean modifier very quickly. And what I'm going to do for the second one is I'm going to start it at zero and end it one frame after, as we've been doing the whole time, at five. So now if I go to the beginning, this one um, is actually going to start at five. So our first one is going to start at five. And the second one is going to end at 4.96. And that's OK, because the next frame in the loop is going to be five. But how do we get these now to uh, blend together nicely? Well, that's fairly easy, actually. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit and uh, bring this up just a touch so we can see what we're doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to frame, let's say, 50. I'm going to input two scale keyframes. And the first one is going to be 2, and the second one is going to be 0. And then let's say I'll go to 70. And then I'll bring this one down to 0 and bring this one up to 2 and hit I again. And now, because we're blending between these two and the sort of ending at the same point, we can get a perfectly looped um, ocean. So I'm just going to let that play. So you don't really see the seam between them. You can make it a little bit longer to make it a little less obvious. You can see the movement is slightly different. Um, so generally, what I'll do is I'll maybe bring this one over a little bit. I actually bring this one over a little bit. There we go. Um, and then the second one here. And for these keyframes, because they're in the middle of the sequence, it doesn't matter if they're linear or not. So I use the Bezier keyframes here just to make it a little less jarring. So you'll see it loops perfectly now, and it looks really interesting. And you get this perfect, perfect ocean, or perfectly looping ocean, which is really cool. Um, if you want to add even more onto that, I'm just going to collapse these modifiers. Uh, what you can do then is add in a wave modifier. And rather than, um, there we go. I'm just going to move this over on the x-axis a little bit. And now what you want, uh, because it's moved over to position 22, so it's down here somewhere. So I'm going to put it at minus 25. Um, generally, what I'll do is set the offset to at least the full amount, or in this case, maybe even double, depending on the speed of the wave of our timeline. So if I offset this time by 240, the waves have all actually um, done all their stuff normally. No, minus 240, because we want it to start 240 frames earlier. So now we actually get a wave. Now to loop this one is a little bit trickier, even though it seems to be working just fine. OK, sometimes you have to fiddle with the speed a little bit to make it work. But apparently, this one's looping perfectly already, um, depending on how wide you might make it. And uh, you mess with the narrowness a little bit. You get these really natural looking waves. I don't know if it'll loop perfectly still, because I've messed with the width yet. Yeah. So I've messed with the width a little bit, which means I'm going to have to change it. If I change it to 2.5, maybe the math will work out then. Yep. Yeah. So now we have this perfectly wavy looping ocean type thing. Um, I don't know if we set the speed to half of that, if it still works, because sometimes you have to mess with the speed a little bit to make it work. But yeah, seems OK. Have a look. OK, seems like it's a little bit off. So that's what I meant. Um, it's all about looking at the speed then. So the speed needs to be slightly quicker. So I just start guessing at this point and just looking at it. Sometimes you just go in and do it manually. It's not really the end of the world. I don't know the exact math of the um, 
of the wave modifier, to be honest, I haven't really looked into it. So let's see if we put 128. And it's just a case of looking at it and trying to get it right. And I think I might have gone too far now. So it's going to be somewhere around here is going to be the sweet spot. Because it's sort of over. Try that. It's still a little bit higher than it should be. So again, you can see I'm just messing around, trying to get it to, to sync up a little bit. And it's not perfect, um, but if you don't see it, yeah. I won't get it 100% perfect. I'm not gonna bore you with me trying to uh, make this sync perfectly. I might just, um, let's see, two, seven, Okay, I'll make sure that it works in the file when you download it, but you get the, the idea, or actually I'm gonna set it to 0.25 because that was working fine the last time, yeah. So I'm just gonna leave it at that and you can mess around with it yourself if you want to. So there we go. Um, perfectly looping waves, which is really cool because you can do that same trick with the, the dupliverts and everything on here because they're all just polygons and if I show the edges, it's just a polygonal surface. So you could go in and add in displacement on top of this, which you can loop perfectly as well. You get these really, really intricate results um, by you know setting up a few things, simple things and making them work together really nicely. So I'm just gonna look at my cheat sheet and look what the next thing is. So the next thing we're gonna look at is how to loop something like a, um, a cloth simulation. So I'm gonna do a very simple example here. Uh, there we go. Duplicate it very quickly and duplicate it again. All right, and then we're gonna remove the doubles and just slice this through, there we go. And then we're gonna subdivide it a couple of times. So I just want something very simple like a flag. That should be okay. And let's just imagine this is a flag stuck to a flag pole. And we're gonna keep it very simple because um, I don't wanna make it more confusing than it has to be. This would work on any sort of complex object. So what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna add my vertex groups in here and I'm gonna set it to, I'll call this pin. So we're gonna use these as pinned vertices for a cloth. Uh, and that way we can have them stay in place. So if you run the simulation, you can see it actually stays in place. But I want this to be sort of a nice wavy flag. So I'm gonna add in a force field very quickly. Um, there we go. So this is gonna, be a little bit of wind. And now we're just gonna increase the strength until the flag actually stays up a little bit. I'm just gonna turn the gravity down a touch. Uh, we don't need this to be super, super realistic. Just so the wind has a little bit more effect and the flag looks kind of interesting. There we go. So now we have a very simple flag. And uh, before I did this, actually, I increased the end frame time to 240. So what if we want another 120 frames of this that we can loop? Um, the answer is actually a lot less complicated than you might think, but it does give uh, it does give some interesting results if you wanna try this stuff. And I've tried it with multiple things and it works quite well. So first thing I'm gonna do is um, have a look at our cloth here and I'm gonna turn on self collision. So that way the uh, flag tries not to intersect itself. There we go. And now we get this nice, cool looking flag. I'm gonna add in just a little bit of turbulence. Where are we? Force, turbulence. Just to add that extra bit of randomness to it. Let's see if we set this to 10.
There we go. It seems to be affecting it. Nice. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to bake this all 250 frames. And um, then if you haven't already, and unfortunately I can't open my user preferences right now. And I don't know if I have it enabled. Let's have a look. Export. Yeah. So if you haven't already, uh, type in PC and you'll get the import export point cache format. So what this is for um, is you can actually export the location of the vertices of an object that don't uh, that doesn't change topology wise. So as long as your vertex count stays the same, you actually export this stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to export this actually export the point cache of this flag and I'm going to put it in the caches folder. I'm going to call that flag 01, export it, and now we've exported the point cache of this uh, selected file. Let me just double check that I did it only for the selected things, but that should be apply modifiers, yeah. So we have 250 frames of this first flag. And now what we can do is if we move this around, for example, we move the turbulence to a different location. Um, we change the strength maybe a little bit, a little bit higher, and change the seed of the noise. And then here in the point cache, or sorry, in the um, cloth, we're going to turn off the bake. And now we're going to have a slightly different result. And the flag is going to sort of wave differently. But the cool thing is, we bake this out again. We now have these two separate animations, and you could probably do the same thing with the um, with the point cache, with the same point cache. But I just want to show you that you can actually mix the two as well. So with that, what we're going to do again is export this as flag two. And give it a second to export. And now I could actually completely remove the cloth modifier, but what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna duplicate it uh, so we can have a different object and we can leave the original stuff in here. Just turn those off very quickly. And now with this object selected, is I'm gonna add the mesh cache, set it to point cache, and point it towards our flag one. So now you can see, um, and it's in a different orientation because we exported it that way. But now you can see we have these two uh, different caches. So I'm going to add in a second mesh cache. And let's add in the second one. And they will overwrite each other. So you can see we have two slightly different caches as I change this. But if we want to do something cool now, what we can do is set this back to 1 and 120. And um, what we can do is have this one animate starting from frame 120 or from frame 121 so that the, the flag isn't falling, but that it's already or actually minus 121. There we go. So now the, the flag is already sort of waving and we, we remove that falling animation. And then uh, what we could do is animate the influence of this one. So this one is actually going to animate with an influence of one from the start. And I know we're getting into some weird territory here. Um, I'm gonna animate this to zero in the middle. I'm just going to reset the uh, the rotation here. So I have no idea why it's doing that, but hey. Um, and then I'm going to animate the influence of this one coming in. So I set this to one. And it's going to flip the flag, isn't it? Okay, so I'm doing something wrong here. Um, let's 
So up is plus C and forward is minus Y. So let's see if we go back and actually put these in. And I'm going to apply the location or rotation scale so we know it's been reset. I'm just going to do it again very quickly throughout these. And you can see some of this is a little, it gets a little messy. Sometimes you just have to make sure everything's correct. And it all has to do with the, the way we exported the point cache. So now for some reason it's flipped. So if we change this to minus Y, let's see if we can get it to look correct. There we go. So now that's okay. I'm gonna copy this one, I'm gonna copy this one again. So I'm gonna need three for this example, but you could probably do it with the same, uh, same point cache if you really wanted it with offsetting it. So this is gonna, start at minus 121 because we want by the time we fade this last one back in we want it to be at frame 120 so this is why this starts one this one starts at zero so I'm going to start this one at minus 121 as well just so it's already moving and it's all about the time and basically making a, an, a graph that you'll see in just a second so I'm going to start keyframe the influence of this one, go over to 60, set this to zero, there we go. And then the second one here is, I'm gonna turn the influence of this one down just a sec, and of this one. So at the beginning, it looks like I didn't put this in the right place, so that one's down to frame one, there we go. So at the beginning, we've got the first one going from one to zero. So we want the second one to sort of go from zero to one in that same time. So now you can see the caches are sort of blending together. And then for the last frame, because this one is now uh, at the right offset to loop again with the first one, and it is a little bit, bit of mental gymnastics. Because I've done this a couple of times, it's fairly logical to me, but I know in the beginning when I was doing this stuff, I was getting fairly confused. So you're gonna have to keep an eye on it and make sure that it works. So towards the last frame, what I'm gonna do is set this one back to zero, and then this one can be zero here. There we go and it can be at the last frame to one. So now what's gonna happen is you see this weird uh, looking thing, but basically what's happening is the first point cache starts at frame 121 because of that offset. It fades out and it mixes with the other one. And because we set this one is a different one, it doesn't really matter, but we wanna make sure it's not still in that stage where the flag was dropping and settling into its animation. Um, we've offset that one. And then by the time we go back to the end, we go back to this one, which is now at frame 120 because we didn't offset it. Still makes sense, still with me? Anyway, the result is pretty cool because you get a flag that basically loops perfectly that you could use in any sort of thing, um, maybe even as a game asset if you needed something to loop perfectly and you can bake it out to something else again. Because you could use this frame and then bake it out to its own point cache or its own Alembic and you have a perfect loop which is really awesome. So I hope that made sense. Sorry about the, the mix up there. And you can see them here animating and doing all their things, which is pretty funny. Um, but it basically just comes down to offsetting it in the time. So I have another example, which uh, involves caching as well. And this is a way that I found to sort of fake particle looping. Um, you'll see what I mean in a second. It's not perfect, but it does work. So again, what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna create a very simple system here. And I'm just gonna have particles come up and I don't want them to be affected by gravity. I just want them to move up. And I'm gonna keep it simple. I'm not gonna make it too complicated. Just wanna make sure we have something here. All right, so let's say we've got these particles and we'd like to um, we'd like to loop these. 
and uh, make sure that they look the same. So the first thing you want to do is actually increase your um, well, first set this to zero and 120. So now we're emitting uh, between the timeline. But actually what we want to do is increase this to the double. So as you can see, after 120 frames, we stop emitting, but we need to have those extra frames for that stuff, um, for the particles to sort of fade out and still be alive. Now, the lifetime here is set to 48. And again, it's just a matter of math um, mathematics. So I go from a 0, uh, 1 to 120 with a lifetime of 48. So that means the last one is being emitted at frame 120. And so basically that means if I go to 120 plus 48 and get 168, and that's when the last frame, um, the last particle should be dead. So there we go. We have that. And uh, let's say you want to add a cube or whatever. And this is why I've been doing this uh, like this, because let's say we have this little cube here. We're going to add a particle instance modifier. And if you're wondering what I'm doing here, check out my video on particles, actually, um, which will show you exactly what's going on here. Not cube four, but plane seven. And I will give these names. So basically, all I'm doing is using this uh, cube as an instance for the particle system. And we're going to un only look at the alive ones. And the reasons I'm doing this is because now we can actually select this object and we can export it as an Alembic cache. So Alembic is sort of like um, the point cache. The only difference is that it supports uh, a little bit more stuff, but also um, objects with a changing number of vertices. So I'm just going to call this particles. See, I'm going to go from frame 1 to 168. Make sure I'm only doing the selected objects. Um, and you can do whatever here. I usually turn off UVs and stuff because I, I don't really need them when I'm shading sometimes. And um, turn off all the particle system stuff because what we're doing is we're just exporting that, um, that mesh that was created by the particle instance. So make sure this is all here. Yeah. Just always make sure you're doing the selected objects only and that your start and end frame are set correctly. So if we export this Alembic file now, what we can do is we can turn off this cube and um, hide this plane for a second. And then we can import an Alembic file. I'm gonna grab that particles.abc. And now what you're gonna see is we actually have these. Now, unfortunately, um, in 2.79, as it stands, you can't just copy this object and start changing stuff here because they're linked together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to import it again. So we have it twice. But for this one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to override the frame and set this back to 120. I'm going to make sure that this Alembic cache is 120 frames ahead of uh, the other one so we get a nice overlap. So uh, you'd think that you could do start animating this from 121, but I'll show you what happens. So this is the second Alembic. So I'm just going to call this ABC1 and ABC2. So the first one is just going to be the first one, and it's going to be normal. Nothing wrong with that. But the second one actually has to be ahead, so there's already particles in there for when we're duplicating this stuff. Now, as I was saying, you'd think you could just go frame 121, hit it, and go towards the end, and go uh, 121 plus 120. But the problem with that is sometimes it tends to jitter. So I found that um, when you animate it this way, it can jitter a little bit. And you want to look out for that. So a way to get around that is by clearing all the keyframes and just adding hashtag frame. So you'll add in a driver plus uh, 120, I believe. And then you'll see it's at frame 121, and it syncs up perfectly. And now you'll see, because we're looping these together, you get a perfect loop of particles. So this is kind of a convoluted way, but it works. Um, and this makes things really interesting because now you can have particles looping. You have all these little effects, and once you bring all of these together, um, that's you know that's when it gets really fun. 
Now, I know I'm, uh, I'm pretty much at the end of the video, so I wanna show you one quick last thing um, in GIMP. So basically, uh, let's see, where's GIMP here? Because some people were asking about that as well, how I loop my um, landscape textures. And let's see if they're still in here. All right, so I found a quickly found one of those landscape ones. And the way I make these seamless is just, it's a very big hack and it works, but not really, but kind of. And, um, you know, if you're rendering stuff with motion blur or whatever, you won't really notice the seam. So uh, in GIMP, I'm just gonna create a selection and then we're gonna inverse that selection. Where are we, invert? So now I just have this border selected. Then I'm um, just gonna feather it a little bit so we have a soft selection. And I know this map is like 8K, so it's not super, um, super efficient to do it with a map this size. But GIMP has this really nice little feature up here in the filters. If you go to map, it says tile seamless. You're gonna to have to give it a second because it's such a large, uh, large thing. But as you can see, it's grabbing my selection and it's actually making a seamless tile. There's a little bit of pinching here on the, the top and the bottom and on the sides. But again, like I said, if you're adding this to something like a cylinder, um, you won't notice it, you won't see it. And uh, I believe in, in Krita, you can do the same, uh, something similar where you hit W and then you can move your canvas around. So now if I deselect it here, where, where are we? There we go. Now you get this perfectly seamless landscape that you can use. Now, depending on how um, much your feather is and how well you blend it and, and mess with this or paint it in a little bit, um, it's gonna look okay to, you know, decent. It's never gonna be perfect, but there you go. That's sort of the, the last thing I wanted to talk about. So I hope um, it was interesting. I'm just gonna go over what we did. So first one was just using doors and um, mirroring and arraying. The second one was using uh, the displace and the empty object. So any modifier that takes this um, object thing, you can experiment with that um, by putting in a loop because you know it always ends up back in the same place. Then we did sort of a similar thing, but with the dynamic paint and um, how you can offset the frames to make that look cool. Then we had the wave and the ocean modifier that looked, uh, looked cool and Towards the end, we had the perfectly looping flag by looping the point caches and then uh, by using two different alembics. And as you can see, like one disappears and then it's back. But because you're looping them at the same point, um, you know, it looks really interesting and they, they blend together really nicely. So I know this was one this one was long overdue, and if you're still here, thanks for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. It's uh it's been kind of a wild ride for me as well discovering all these different ways of looping. But I think I've got pretty much most, if not all of the all of the ways I do it now down in this one video. So I hope you guys enjoy uh, these making these loops as much as I do. They're a lot of fun and you get into some really interesting stuff. So that's it for the Lush Loops episode. Um, yeah, have a good day and uh, see you next time.